chapter 11. One of the saddest chapters in the Bible. Because a hero has fallen. David, the most beloved person in the whole Bible, other than Jesus, I would think would be David. King David, he loved God. He wrote 60% of the Psalms. He loved God. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Up to this point, David has had victory upon victory. He defeated the Ammonites. He defeated the giants. We saw that last week. The giants, literal giants. Second Chronicles talks about that. So he, he defeated the Ammonites and their mercenary soldiers, the Arameans. He defeats the giants. But he can't defeat his own lust. And he's defeated. He's defeated by his lack of self-control. And from chapter 11 to the, till David dies, he pays the price for adultery with Bathsheba. He pays the price for the rest of his life. For the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Now, <clears throat> I want us to examine this. And I want us to ask the question. How to avoid the sin of adultery? How to avoid sexual sin? So well, I'm not married, so I can't commit adultery. Well, you can commit fornication... That's sexual sin also. So how to avoid sexual sin? Let's take, let's take it apart. <clears throat> you might say, I have no problem in that area. Famous last words. <clears throat> Famous last words. First of all, you need to beware of periods of vulnerability in your life. Vulnerability. Transitions. David is going through a transition. Verse 1. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon. And besieged Reba. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Stop right there. David stayed home. This was not his usual practice. He had always gone to war with his troops. Look at chapter 5 verse 2. He had always gone to battle. He never stayed home. Chapter 5, verse 2. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord was with you. He always led from the front. Look at chapter 8 of 2 Samuel. Verse 1, now after this it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them and David took control of the chief city from the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab. Verse 3, and David defeated Hadazer, the son of Rahab, king of Zophah. And you read that whole section, and it's always David. David defeated this king, and David defeated that king. He was always at the front of the line, always leading the charge. But now, he's staying home. Why? 
Why is David staying home? Something had changed. Chapter 18 of 2 Samuel is what happened. 2 Samuel 18, verse 3. But the people said to David, you should not go out to battle. For if we indeed flee, they will not care about us. Even half of us, even if half of us die, they will not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore now it is better that you be ready to help us from the city. Chapter 21, verse 17. 21.17 But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go out against us to battle so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. So the transition. David went from being an active warrior king on the battlefield to staying behind. That was the request of his military advisors. You stay behind. We can't have you killed. You're worth 10,000 of us. We don't want to extinguish the lamp of Israel. So this is a change. This is a transition. This is something different. Staying home. He's now vulnerable. And Satan knows when to attack you. When you're vulnerable. He stayed home. He was alone. He was worried. He was sleepless. He was idle. And you know that idleness is the devil's playground. Idleness is the devil's playground. So back in our text in chapter 11, so what you got to do is you, when you're going through a transition, be very careful. That's when Satan attacks. When you're going through a transition, you're more vulnerable. That can take... Transitions in life can come in all different, all different ways. <clears throat> you might have a new job. That's a transition. Your kids might grow up and leave the house. That's a transition. You're an empty nester. That's a transition. You might have an illness and you're not what you used to be physically. That's a transition. You might have a baby. That's a transition. Whenever you're going through a transition, remember, that's when you're vulnerable. That's when you're vulnerable. David was going through a transition because no longer was he going out to battle. He was staying behind. Now, verse 2. 11 verse 2. Now, when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. He was alone walking around on the roof of, the, of his house, of his palace. Let me ask you this question. Where were his wives? He had a lot of wives. Why did he need to get up and go walk around on the roof? Where were all his wives? He had a lot of them. 2 Samuel 5.13. 5.13. Meanwhile, David took more concubines. These are like unofficial wives. More than the ones he already had. He took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. We don't know their names, but he took more of them. He took more. We do know that he had 
I, I wrote them down here. One, two, three, four. Seven. He had seven wives that we know about. He had Michelle, Abigail, Ahinoam, Mecca, Haggith, Abital, and Eglah. He had one, two, three, four, five, seven wives that we know about, and he took more. So he had more than seven wives and concubines. Why is he all alone at night when you have at least seven wives? Why is he alone on the roof walking around with all these women at his disposal? He's, he, he's lonely. He's lonely even though he's got all kinds of women around him. You see, that's the danger of polygamy. David was a polygamist. You can have a lot of women, a lot of wives, and still be lonely. That's the danger of it. That's why the Bible talks about not polygamy, but monogamy. One man, one woman for life. Till death do you part. Because when it gets when uh, the trials and tribulations, the loneliness and the bad health come, you want your woman or your man to be there for you. When you have a wife and a mistress, maybe a girlfriend, you aren't fulfilled because there's no trust and real intimacy. You don't trust any of these women and they don't trust you because they, you, they know what you're about. So David's all alone on the rooftop and he has all these wives. That's why Proverbs chapter 5 gives us some good counsel. Proverbs 5 verse 15. It says right here to drink water from your own cistern. Cistern is a, like a well of water. Fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, not wives, wife, as a loving hind and graceful doe. Let her breast Getting embarrassed? The Bible is very clear about this kind of stuff. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? In other words, love your wife. Love your wife. Otherwise, you'll end up like David one night walking around by yourself on the roof of your house. Here's something really interesting. At the end of David's life, it's kind of sad. Look at 1 Kings. The end of his life, keep in mind he had all these wives. He had a whole harem. 1 Kings 1. This is the end of David's life when he's an old man. He's no longer a warrior. <clears throat> he's infirmed. He's bedridden. He's old. He can't keep warm. 1 Kings 1 verse 1. Now, King David was old, advanced in age. And they covered him with clo cloths, a lot of blankets. But he could not keep warm. So a servant said to him, Let them seek a young virgin for my lord the king, and let her 
attend the king and become his nurse. And let her lie in your bosom that my lord the king may keep warm. So they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Sulamite and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful and she became the king's nurse and served him. But the king did not cohabit with her. There was no sexual intimacy with, with this, young, this young virgin. She slept with him to keep him warm because all the blankets in the world could not keep him warm. She became his nurse and she kept him warm at night. Now, question, where were his wives? Where were his wives? Why'd they have to go get another young virgin? He had all these wives. How come they didn't get one of them to go sleep with him? Keep him warm. It was a very dysfunctional situation. When he was young, he was tempted. None of his wives were around. He sinned. When he's old, he's, he's freezing and none of his wives are around. That's what happens when you don't take care of the one woman that God gave you. You end up a lonely, cold, old man, freezing. Even though you've had a lot of women in your life, none of them are there for you at the end. So you better start focusing on the one you have and stop looking around for, for, for a better model. That's why pe people treat relationships now like they, re they treat cars. They're always looking around for a, a newer model. Trade the older one in. That's okay in the world of automobiles, but in relationships, grow old with the one God gave you. Otherwise, you're going to be an old man freezing. And they're not going to find some young virgin to sleep with you either. That's an, he, David was a king. David was a king. You're not. You're going to be all by yourself, just freezing you like that. Thinking about your, your wife of your youth that you abused and weren't faithful to, and she could have been with you. Okay, here's another key right here. 2 Samuel 11. Third principle, set boundaries. The king, verse 1, um, David stayed at Jerusalem, verse 2. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David inquired about the woman. And one said, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of Alim, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers and took her. And she came and he lay with her. Now, here's my question. The king palace is up here, maybe on a hill. He's on the roof, walking around. And he has direct access to his neighbor's backyard, a courtyard, where there's an outdoor a bathtub. And he sees Bathsheba there. So he's up here, and he has direct access access to his neighbor's backyard. Clean line of sight into his neighbor's courtyard. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have found that kind of creepy. I would not have wanted to have access to my neighbor's backyard. Matter of fact, we have some new neighbors right in our backyard. And they took down a small tree that kind of blocked the view from my sliding glass door and their sliding glass door. So now I can stand there and look right into their house. 
because we're a little bit higher. And I guess they can do the same for me, but I'm a little higher than them. So I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't want to be able to look inside their house with the lights on at night because they don't have curtains or anything. So I went and planted a tree right there. Because I don't want to be able to see into their house. They obviously don't care if I do, but I, I don't want to be able to see it. I, I feel uncomfortable with it. So I planted a couple trees. I want to block the view. Not, not so that they can't see mine, but because we have curtains, but I don't want to be able to see in there. It feels creepy. So I'm setting up boundaries. Now, I don't know, David, he could have, he could have put some uh, privacy hedges. Or they, Bathsheba's house. She knows the king's palace is right there with a direct access, direct line of sight to her back. What is she doing bathing in the middle of the night knowing the king's walking around up there? You need boundaries. That's the point. Boundaries. There was no boundaries. You need to set up boundaries in your life with the opposite sex. You just have to do it. You've got to say, I can be friendly, but I cannot have a good friend that's not my wife. I mean, unless you're single. If you're single, that's a different story. As long as she's not married. Maybe you should find some friends. But if you're married, your wife is your best friend. You don't start sharing problems with another woman. You're opening the door to possibilities because all affairs start the same place with friendship. Friendship. So you got to set up boundaries. <clears throat> and then, here's another principle. You got to put your blinders on. You have to have self-control with your eyes. Verse 2, David's on the roof of the king's house. From the house he saw a woman bathing. He saw her. What should he have done? Gone back downstairs to his bedroom. Well, with one of his 10, 12, 15 wives. He should have fled down to the safety but he doesn't. He starts to stare at her. He saw her. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. How, how, does, how does he know that? How does he know she's beautiful? Because he's just checking her out from the roof like a real creepy guy. He's just checking her out. He sees her and then he... She's beautiful. She's beautiful. How does he know... He's examining her from a distance. I don't know if he had binoculars or how close it was, but she was beautiful in appearance. <clears throat> he gazed and studied her. So you have got to put your blinders on. Because there's a lot of beautiful women walking around. You may not see them bathing, but half of them walk around half naked. So you've got to have self-discipline with your eyes. Self-discipline. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs 4, verse 23. It says here, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. So your heart, once you start feeling emotions toward another woman, not your wife, another woman, you watch your heart. Because from your heart flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. 
Put deceiving, put devious speech far from you. Here it is. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. You got to you have to discipline your eyes straight in front of you. I believe it's Job that says, how shall I gaze upon a virgin? In other words, discipline. It takes a lot of self-control. A lot of discipline. David obviously did not have it, and he ruined his life because of it. So you've got to learn to put your blinders on. Unless it's your wife. Then you have to Compliment her. Flatter her. Man, you look beautiful today. You look stunning. That outfit looks great on you. You focus on her. That's the one God gave you. Focus on your wife or your husband. All this other beauty you see around you, it's not yours. Now, it doesn't belong to you. So why get yourself all messed up? Just look straight ahead. Straight ahead. Here's another principle. Have your spiritual antennas up. Now, I don't know for sure what the story is with Bathsheba. Some people think she seduced David. Two, two sides of the spectrum. One side, probably the minority position, believes that Bathsheba was taking a bath out there. She was trying to seduce the king. Others say, no, she was, she was not doing that. David basically, he raped her. He sent somebody to get her, and he's the king. He can do whatever he wants. So, I don't know, between these two extremes, maybe there's something in the middle. Now, let's, let's, for the sake of the message here, you've got to know when you're being seduced. Bathsheba, if she wasn't trying to seduce David, she was at least very careless. Very careless, because she didn't have a privacy hedge. And there was a direct line of sight to the palace. And she's taking a bath, probably at night. So she's not very, and her husband's away. Her husband's at war. She's a military wife. Uriah is at war. So she's very careless. She may not have been trying to seduce David, but she was careless. She was careless. Now, if she was trying to seduce him, it worked. It worked. So you've got to have your antennas up. Hey, this person's flirting with me. Not me personally. I'm too old to be flirted on. But uh, you got to remember, you've got to sense that. You gotta sense it. And you gotta walk the other way. Because if you don't, let me read some verses to you. Proverbs chapter 5. Well, you know what? I take that back. Nobody's ever too old. I don't wanna I don't wanna leave that there because you might say I have no problems in this area. I'm old. Proverbs 5, verse 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of shield. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. 
How then, my son, listen, do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, or you will give your vigor to others, your ears to the cruel one. And then it goes on. Be careful with the seductive, sweet words of, of, a, of, a, of a adulterous woman. Again, chapter 6 of Proverbs, verse 24. To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread. Verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? It goes on, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire. Keep your antennas up. Be on the alert to seduction because it happens. Here's another principle. Don't dehumanize people. She had a name that we all know. What was her name? Bathsheba. She wasn't just a beautiful object. She wasn't just a sexual conquest. She had a name. She was a woman. She was a person. And when you see somebody as a person... You're less, likely to, you're less likely to abuse, use, and, and uh, discard them. She had a name, Bathsheba. She had parents. She had parents. Verse 3, so David went and inquired about the woman, and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So, she had parents. Her father was Eliam. What do we know about her father? Well, he was a very important person, her father. 2 Samuel, chapter 23. He was a very important person. His daughter was Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 23, verse 34. Now, this lit, chapter, chapter 23 is all about the mighty men. Verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. These were all mighty men. There was a number of mighty men. These were loyalists to David. They were totally loyal to David. Look at verse 15. David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Totally loyal, totally subservient. Their mission in life was to protect and please King David. One of those men was Eliam, verse 34. Eliphat, the son of Abishai, the son of uh, Machalite, Eliam, there it is, the son of Ahithophel. Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. Eliam, the father of Bathsheba, was one of David's mighty men. One of these loyal warriors that would do anything for David. He was the father of Bathsheba. And David must have known that. Eliam is the son of Ahithophel. Who's he? Who is Ahithophel? Well, 2 Samuel 16, 23. I'm trying to prove a point right here, so just stay with me. 2 Samuel 16, 23. The advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one inquired of the word of God. 
so was all the advice of Ahithophel regarded by David and Absalom. He was a highly esteemed counselor that David listened to. When Ahithophel spoke, it was as if he was speaking the words of God. So Ahithophel was the father of Eliam, who was the father of who? Bathsheba. Eliam was a mighty man. So David is messing with the wrong gal. She's connected. She's the granddaughter of Ahithophel. So she had a father. She had a name. She had parents, a father that we know of. She had a husband. She had a husband, chapter 11, verse 3. David went and inquired of the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Who is he? He's a mighty man also. He's in that list. Uriah, the father, I mean, the, not only was the father of Bathsheba a mighty man, but the husband of Bathsheba was a mighty man. And the Bible always emphasized Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So she had a name, she had a father, she had a husband. She's going to have a child. She's going to have a child. Chapter 11, verse 5. The woman conceived and she sent and told David. Nobody wants to hear these words. I mean, unless you're married. I'm pregnant. I just wanted a good time. Good time, Charlie. I just wanted a one-night stand with Bathsheba. I didn't have any intentions of a long-term relationship, but now she's pregnant. It happens. It happens. So... I, this is, so David knew that Bathsheba was the daughter of one of his mighty men. He knew that she was the wife of one of his mighty men. He knew that she was the granddaughter of Ahithophel, the chief wise man of the time. And he still did what he did. He still did what he did. He brought her to the palace. He had sex with her. Knowing all of this. What does that say? The power of lust. It is so powerful. You can't rationalize with it. You can't argue with it. You can't say, you know, you know, this is off limits. This is really off limits. She's the wife of one of my mighty men. Two. She's, she's related to two of my mighty men. Her father and her husband. I mean, rationally, he would have gone back in. He would have gone back and taken a cold shower. Said, no, I'm not, I'm not going there. This is just this is just wrong on so many so many so it's this is wrong on so many levels. But he did it anyway. Did it anyway. That's the danger of sexual sin. That's lust. It's a very powerful emotion. That's why you gotta do what Joseph did in Genesis twenty nine. 39, he fled. When the wife of Potiphar was trying to seduce him, ripping his clothes off, he didn't rationalize it. He didn't argue with her. He didn't think it through. He just fled. That's what you got to do. Because lust is very powerful. 
That's why you can't even start playing with it. <coughs> so Bathsheba, she's not just an object for gratification. She has a name. She has a father. She has a husband. She, has, she now has a child. Things are getting really complicated now. I'm pregnant. We're going to see how that affects his life. For the, re for the rest of his life, he was affected by this sin. By this sin. So I've tried to give you some principles on how to avoid sexual sin. you got to really take it seriously. You've got to beware of seasons of vulnerability because you're, you're weak at that time. You've got to attend and value your one wife that you have. He had lots of them, but yet he was alone on the rooftop. And he ended up a lonely, cold old man. You've got to set boundaries. You've got to put up a privacy hedge so you can't see down into your neighbor's backyard. Especially when they're taking a bath. Set up boundaries. You've got to put your blinders on. He saw, and she realized how beautiful she was because he didn't just see, he gazed, he studied. Put your blinders on. Have your antennas up when things are kind of getting strange and maybe seduction is taking place. And don't dehumanize, don't dehumanize people. She had a name, she had a father, a husband. She's going to have a child. This sin is very devastating today. It's taking out a lot of people. It's destroying a lot of marriages. It's destroying a lot of young people. And Lord willing, this, this devastating sin of David will help, help you stay strong and pure. Let's pray. We'll invite a rusher forward. Our Father, Lord, there's so many lessons to be learned with the sin of David and Bathsheba. We know his life is not going to be very complicated. <clears throat> and he's going to pay a devastating price for this sin on the rooftop. Because that's where it all started. His gaze, his, what he saw. And I pray you would help every single one of us to be disciplined, those that are married, that we would cherish our spouse, take care of them, value them. Those that aren't and that want to be, that they would be the right person so that they can attract the right person someday. And now we pray you would bless tonight's offering. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.